put a human face on our situation. We are grateful for our survivors' talks and the ways that they touch our hearts. Because so often at other presentations, we hear numbers. We sometimes hear stories of individuals, but it takes on a different meaning when we see and hear from the survivor. When we imagine ourselves having to walk in their footsteps, as we're challenged to find ways to pick up the mantle that they have carried for us, as we try to not just transform ourselves, but transform our world to be a better place. Some of the numbers related to the story you will hear tonight are almost 107,000 Jews in the Netherlands who were sent off to camps. Another 20 to 30,000 Jewish persons who went into hiding when the Nazis occupied the country. It's estimated that only 25% of the Jewish population survived. But tonight's story is a story of survival. It begins, like all stories begin, with a birthday. It begins when a young lady by the name of Hannah Lore Klein was born uh, into Frankfurt, Germany. Her family was friends with the Frank family. Many of us who follow Holocaust stories and even those who barely know anything have probably heard the story of Anne Frank. Tonight's story is interwoven with that story. Anne would have been about two and a half years younger than our guest speaker tonight. They were both born into the same community there in Hamburg, and both of their families eventually moved to the Netherlands as they were trying to find a safer place to be. Both of their families found themselves put on lists to be deported. The stories have different endings. The stories are powerful. The stories are relevant to us today. As we hear this story tonight of this incredible journey of four different lives that are woven together in a book that you will hear about, I pray that you might open your hearts as well as your ears to find ways how this story interconnects with your story, with our story, and how we transform a story that is going to follow beyond us, a story that is better because we are made better by sharing our lives. Tonight, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you a scholar, a linguist, a writer, a professor, a wonderful human being, someone who has taught at Portland State University, who has spoken all across the nation at various events much like this to share her story, which is our story. It is my honor and my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dr. Laureen Nossbaum. Thank you very much for your introduction. I wish you would leave, have left me some of your clearly well articulated, slowly spoken way of conveying what you want to say. I tend to talk too fast, and I have to ask you all to uh, just raise your hand or say, slow down. I am, I am not a trained speaker. I've spoken quite a bit, but I do it so by the flight of my pants. I really am not a trained speaker. So I once in a while need to be stopped and brought back down to earth, you know, if I take off in a flight. And I, it does not bother me if you raise your hand and you want me to speak closer? Is that better? Ah. 
Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Now. Okay. I'll try to stay close to the to the mic. Uh, I always like to begin with the preface of my book because it sort of puts things in place. In 1992, the Except Mission and Frank in the World came to Portland, Oregon, where my husband and I had made our home for over 30 years. The exhibition was a major event. Some two dozen people in the greater Portland area who had lived through the Holocaust were willing to speak about their experiences. They told their stories, answered questions, bringing the 72,000 visitors closer to what had happened in Europe under the Nazi regime half a century earlier, and I was one of those witnesses. In 1936, my parents emigrated with their three daughters from Frankfurt, Frankfurt Main, there are two Frankfurts in Germany, to Amsterdam. We, the Kleins, settled in the same neighborhood as Anne Frank's family, whom we had known in Frankfurt. Margot Frank, <coughs> Anne's older sister, was among the first 4,000 Jewish refugees age 16 to 40, ordered to report for forced labor in Germany. My older sister, Susie, was served the same summons. Anne had just turned 13, I was almost 15, and my younger sister, 12, all three of us too young under the edict to be sent away. It is well known from Anne's diary that the day after Margot received the summons, the Frank family went into hiding in the back quarters of Otto Frank's business. They managed to hold out for 25 months, thanks to the loving care of Mr. Frank's clerical staff and to the unwavering support of his business partners. Anne wrote vividly about their secret life above the office at the warehouse rooms. Sadly, Otto Frank was the only one in the family to survive the war. Anne and Margot died from typhus in Bergen-Belsen, and Mrs. Frank succumbed to exhaustion in Auschwitz. Upon his return to Amsterdam, despite his tremendous loss, Mr. Frank was happy to find his business partners and his office staff had survived the horrors, and that my family still lived in the same apartment where he had last visited us three years before. How had we esca escaped the dance of death, he asked us at the time, a question repeated again and again when I speak about the Holocaust. There were good Germans besides Oskar Schindler with his now famous list. Thanks to one of them, a little known lawyer named Hans Kallmeier, my family and thousands of other Jews survived. As one who had benefited from Kallmeier's courage, I have long felt the urge to write his story in English. Hans Kallmeier saved the lives of more Jews than Schindler. And I owe Karl Meyer a great and unpayable debt. I fervently hope that this book, which is for sale, which blends my family's story with his, will help to bring him the international recognition that he is due. So that's the introduction to the book. Okay, let's see whether I can handle the pictures. Yeah, okay. So this is, these are the three of us, my older sister Susie on the, on the left, and I'm on the right, and little Marley in the middle. In the middle. Um, so my early childhood in Frankfurt 
was rather pleasant. A middle class family, comfortable. My father could take care of the needs of the family. My mother was a full-time mother. And uh, life was easy and pleasant for me as a child. That changed rapidly after 1933. One uh, law after the other, excluding the Jews in Germany, was promulgated. We had to go to Jewish schools. We couldn't participate in any sports. We could not go to any uh, concerts or uh, performances. Anything cultural, anything recreational was out of bounds for us. We were clearly discriminated against. Again, against, I am sorry. Um, so in 1936, my parents decided that we better get out of the way and move to the Netherlands. The Netherlands appeared to be a good choice because during World War I, the Netherlands had been neutral and we had hoped whatever Hitler perpetrates, he will leave the Netherlands alone, which he didn't. Of course, in May of 1940, the German Army and the German Air Force made their way to the Netherlands. Rotterdam was severely bombed. The, it was relatively easy to uh, defeat the Dutch Army. The Dutch were not enthusiastic soldiers like the Germans. And uh, after five days, the Netherlands had to give up and we were settled with an occupation government, which is no fun. It's no fun to live in an occupied country anywhere in the world. Uh, maybe I should first now show the pictures of my mom and my dad. Okay. My father was 12 years older than my mother. Um, Life in the Netherlands for us children was really quite pleasant. We learned the language fast and adapted very well. And one of the French benefits that I felt very strongly was we knew things better than our parents. We could tell them, uh, 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 you can't say that. You have to say such and such. It's a wonderful democratizing experience <laughs> to be able to tell your parents what's right and what's wrong. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, my older sister and I went to high school. In Holland, we have six years of elementary school and then go to high school, no middle schools, and did well and liked the school. And as, as, when the Germans first came to the Netherlands, they said they would leave the Dutch way of life intact. We did not have to worry. They would not... Uh, Foist the German laws upon us, but of course they did. So by the, uh, January of 1941, a law was promulgated that said anybody who is Jewish has to register. And uh, Jewish was de defined as four or three Jewish grandparents. If you had two Jewish grandparents, then it depended on whether or not these grandparents, uh, the non-Jewish part actually was a member of the Jewish community or not. Now, the f ridiculous thing was, this was a racial definition according to the Germans. Well, how can you define race according to religion? And so, of course, there were a number of people who felt that they had been misqualified and the harsher the laws against the Jews became, the more people felt that they had been misqualified because we saw coming that our life would be terrible. And so uh, my mother, who was half Jewish herself, and her mother, my grandmother, I hope I, well, her picture is not here yet. Okay, I'll come later. Um, thought up a wonderful story uh, pretending that the Jewish father of my mother was not her father. And they had the right papers and they worked it out so that uh, whatever they said was uh, sort of substantiated by papers. 
that were pretty waterproof because the Dutch have a great reputation as printers. Elsevier Printers is just famous in the whole world for doing their excellent work. And the, the Dutch were unsurpassed masters in falsifying papers, <laughs> which is really great. So uh, now I leave my story alone and go to Kangmaier, excuse me. Hans Karlmeier was the son of a German Lutheran family in Osnabrück. He was the youngest of three boys. Uh, he was born in 1903. His brothers were born at the very end of the 19th century. And both his older brothers had to serve in the German army during World War I. And both of them were killed at the Western Front within two weeks or even less, 10 days as young soldiers, 18 and 19 year old. So Hans was the only child left, and he was thoroughly, thoroughly anti-militaristic. He just did not believe in uh, the Prussian, uh, well, love for the military. In fact, his father was uh, assigned as a judge, was assigned a position in an area which is now again Poland, which was uh, for a while, German, and Hans, as a young boy, felt much closer to the Polish underdog than the, to the German rulers. He had a sense for the underdog that was really very strong and very touching. Um, I, there's no time for me to read. Uh, his diary entries, but here is, here is Hans Kalmeyer as, as a young boy. Um, maybe I should just read what he was thinking about as a 21-year-old law student. I, thought, I think that should, sort of characterizes him. Um, yes. He says, he asked himself, what would make for a truly good person? And the answer he gives himself is one who is characterized by kindness. There are ridiculously small things that are possibly bigger than the great heroic deeds. They do not inspire awe. On the contrary, they appear pitiful and foolish, and yet they are informed by more intrinsic, in, intimate, intimate value. And he felt that being good, being kind is the main thing, which is rather, uh, I would say, remarkable for a 20-year-old uh, law student. The next picture is Hans Kalmeyer as a student. He's not smoking a pipe, I don't know. He, he was an outrageously uh, cigarette smoker, really. He smoked way too many cigarettes, but I don't know what he has in his mouth there. I think a cigarette, yes, of course, a cigarette. What else would it be? All right. Um, he thought seriously of leaving Germany and emigrating. But a lawyer, anyway, anybody who is, who is doing law, is particularly difficult to change countries. Uh, in all of continental Europe, there's Napoleonic law. And in all the Anglo-Saxon countries, there is precedence law. And the two do not mesh at all. So you would, he would have had to start from scratch. And he was advised by other anti-Nazis not to even try to emigrate because it would be just terrible. So he stayed, never became a member of the Nazi party, but stayed in Germany and associated with a number of uh, people who were anti-Nazis in, in the city of Osnabrück. Eventually, in 1939, when he was 36 years old, he was drafted, he had to serve, and he served in the Air uh, Defense Command, 
And eventually, when the German troops invaded the Netherlands, he found himself in the Netherlands as a soldier, hating every bit of it. And so when, uh, after the Germans had installed their occupation government in The Hague, he noticed that one of his colleagues, an older friend, a lawyer of Osnabrück, had an important function at the um, office of the Reichskommissar, the highest Bakbakmak up there, who ran the Dutch, uh, Dutch life. And so uh, Karl Mayer went to Studer and asked, would you by chance have a job for me? And Studer, who was a member of the Nazi party, but not out of any conviction, but because it was the only way of being promoted and making a career, Studer said, yes, you are just the man I need, and employed him and gave him the position of adjudicator for any cases that Jewish people made to have their classification as Jews changed into non-Jews. It, it was really a miracle that he landed this position. He didn't know when he uh, tried to get a position. And so um, Hans Kallmeier became the adjudicator, which had the stipulation that whatever he decided was irrevocable. Nobody could change what he decided, which of course gave him a tremendous amount of power. And he used it very, very thoughtfully. Uh, people after a while, Dutch lawyers who helped the Jews to uh, get their case uh, shown to Karl Mayer or the petition written, knew what he wanted. He wanted verified, stamped papers that said either that your grandfather and your grandmother, although they were misqualified as, Jew, as Jews, had really been baptized and were never part of the Jewish community. And the Dutch, being such wonderful falsifiers, found old paper and printed with old print and produced the papers necessary to prove that uh, the grandfather and or the grandmother was not Jewish. And if these papers were more or less waterproof, Karl Mayer felt that he could go ahead and give a stamp of approval. He knew he was being cheated, but he had to be cheated well in order to cover his own back. And that went very well in more than 3,800 cases that he adjudicated in favor of the petitioner. So now I have to see what they are show you a few more pictures of Karl Mayer. This is Karl Mayer with his wife uh, as a young married man. And I'm now returning again to my own story. My grandmother, my non-Jewish grandmother, there she is, quite a lady, really. Uh, of course, swore up and down the letter that, that my grandfather had not been Jewish and uh, made it stick with the necessary falsified papers. Uh, she was our savior in many ways, with Karl Mayer. If it hadn't been for my grandmother and for Karl Mayer, I wouldn't be here talking, quite definitely not. Um, about growing up in the Netherlands, I just quickly want to show pictures of Margot and Anne and, and myself. The first one is Margot Frank. At school, we had every year typical pictures where we had to sit like this and look up and, and look friendly. That was it. We didn't have a yearbook, but we had pictures. Uh, the next one is me, sitting in the same position. And the next one is Anne Frank, not sitting in the same position because she was not yet in high school. Her picture was taken in sixth grade in the Montessori school. And that school was actually in the same block where we lived. You could look down and see the kids play in the sand pile and what have you. So this is Anne, typically writing. She very early started writing diaries, very, very early. Um, let me see where, since I can't do my the whole long story, I have to be selective and find things that I hope will be of interest to you. Um,
I, I guess I will uh, show this one picture of Karl Mayer as a reluctant soldier, although you don't see the reluctance, but he's the one in the middle. That's Karl Mayer. Well, um, there was a big roundup in February of 1941 in the Netherlands. Uh, Jews in the Jewish quarter of Amsterdam were rounded up because there had been a, a riot in a, a ice cream parlor and uh, people had come to blows and that was taken out on, on, on a number of Jewish people in the Jewish quarter. The Amsterdam population was indignant and went on a general strike. And I, as far as I know, this is the only place, the only country where non-Jews went on strike to support their Jewish fellow citizens. The February strike of February 25th, 1941, is still a very much uh, observed event in Dutch history. Every year, uh, flowers are brought to the monuments. Every year, people come and uh, pay their respects to the people who did not come back from the camps. So that's an important uh, benchmark in Dutch history, really. Um, the actual rounding up of Jews in a systematic way started in the summer of 1942, to be precise, on the 5th of July of 1942. And the Frank family went into hiding the next day. Uh, I think my numbers deviate a little bit of the introduction, but as far as I always learned, about 25,000 Jews went into hiding in the Netherlands. And of those, 15,000 survived in hiding. The other 10,000 were either betrayed or betrayed themselves or died in hiding, whatever. Still 15,000 people saved is quite a number and it's quite to the credit of the Dutch population in general. Uh, there were Nazis at the best time for the Nazis. The Nazi party, the NSB, had 5% of the population. So they never really could gain the hearts and minds of the Dutch populations. And of course, once the Germans started losing in North Africa and in Russia, then the few Nazis that were quickly turned away out of opportunism. But these are the people one doesn't really like, you know. Nazis out of opportunism and non-Nazis, again, out of opportunism. But there were some of those. Not all Dutch people were wonderful, but many of them were, really. Now, I am going to step away from uh, Karl Mayer and from my own story to tell my husband's story. My husband was fully Jewish, and there was no way that he could fudge his background. In 1941, at the time of the February strike, he already left his parents' home. At that time, he was 19, and or almost 19, and uh, went into semi-hiding. He had to finish, he thought, his uh, training as a ship engineer, but he moved to a non-Jewish family where he stayed uh, until he had passed his final examination. And the day he passed his final examination, he had his bicycle packed and he went into hiding. This was in July of 1941, much earlier than most anybody else. Uh, the next picture is the little farmhouse where he was hiding. From 50 miles away from Amsterdam. The Peasants, it's really, they were peasants, they were not farmers, they, had, they were very, very poor. The, the, the daddy in the family had four years of education. He could barely read and write. But they had a heart and they helped. Rudy said at the time, you know, I am Jewish and if you get caught, it might cost your life. And they said, you just come and stay here. It was really fantastic. Um, I got to know Rudy uh, as early as 1938. 
when he, his family came to Amsterdam, we had come in 36, they had a drugstore around the corner. I, from our balcony from three, uh, three floors up, I could look down to their little garden and I saw Rudy dismantle his whole bicycle and oiling every part. <laughs> he really took excellent care of his bicycle. That's what I first saw of him. Pretty soon it turned out that his father played the violin very well and had a good singing voice, and Rudy played the piano very well. And my mother had always been into chamber music. In fact, her mother, my non-Jewish grandmother, was a professional singer, so music had always been very important in the family. I didn't inherit it, but I can't help it. I wish I, I had gotten my share, but somehow they skipped me. I don't know. Anyway, uh, the next, so Rudy then went into hiding this little farmhouse, and here's a picture of the two of us in 1941, when I had a mature, ripe age of 14, and he was 19. Okay. And all through the war, I remained his liaison with the, I was above ground, he was underground, and I remained his liaison through all these years. You have seen the picture of the, my sisters and me when we were Young kids in Germany, here's another picture of the three of us in Amsterdam on our balcony. Oops, what happened? Ah. Something happened to the, to the order. Uh, something didn't work, okay. I'm sorry. Something went wrong. Let me see, okay, that's fine. That these, these are the two IDs of Rudy. The top one is his Jewish one, and the bottom one is his falsified one. He was Johannes Martinus Edel. That was his false name. Had a different age. He was six years, five years older than he really was. And uh, but the picture is mounted carefully. The stamp is traced carefully, and this. Uh, served him through the war. Okay, then I guess the picture of my sisters and me is in the, oh, here we are. Here we are on the balcony of uh, where we lived in Amsterdam. And from this balcony, uh, we could look down to the Montessori school where Anne Frank went to school. So this was all in the same block. The, the Nussbaum family with their drugstore, the clients on the third floor, and uh, around another corner, the Montessori school. And it's all still standing there. I actually took my Dutch uh, nephew and nieces to all these places at some point. Um, what happened in Germany in 1935, when we had to leave public school and go to Jewish schools, happened the same thing in Amsterdam in the Netherlands in the fall of 1941. And the next picture is a picture of my Jewish class. You can see the stars all over the place. We all had to wear a star. That's taken uh, in ninth grade, at the end of ninth grade. So that would have been uh, after May of uh, 1941. Uh, at that point, uh, my mother had already handed in a petition to, uh, for us uh, to see her recognized as totally non-Jewish and for us girls to be half Jewish. And the petition actually was uh, very important because we were rounded up in one of those razzias, what's the word we use? Razzia is an Arabic word which we use in the Netherlands for roundups. So we had a razzia in uh, August the 6th memorable date, of 1942, my mother and my sisters and I were rounded up. My father mercifully wasn't home, and my mother went up to whoever were the commanding people while we were all rounded up in the school uh, play, playground and said, uh, I have a petition going, I'm wrongly qualified as a Jew, uh, you will find me on the list of Karl Mayer, and uh, we are, we are uh, um, deferred. And indeed, she made a stick, and my mother and my sisters and I could go home again, thanking heaven that my father was not part of this party, because he might not have been allowed to go back home. Uh, about my non-Jewish grandmother, she had an interesting past. 
She was uh, the daughter of a Catholic family in Austria, quite near to the Polish border. And she and her sisters were extremely musical. They formed a quartet, uh, a cappella quartet. These are the four Ronsdorf sisters. Uh, my grandmother is the one on the extreme left. They had beautiful voices. They could harmonize. They were just ever so musical. I, as I said, I wish I got my share of that, but I, I didn't. Then <laughs> uh, I, I skip to the next picture of my grandmother and my mother. My mother actually grew up in, uh, not with my grandmother, because my grandmother was traveling. My mother grew up in a foster family, but she's a Protestant family in Dresden. But she spent vacations with her mother, and here's a picture of my grandmother and my mother. My mother was born in 1899, and whenever she was old-fashioned, we would say, oh, mom, that's so old-fashioned. And she would say, what do you want? I was born in the last century, you know. <laughs> she was born in July of 19, uh, 1899. Anyway, um, well, if I keep the order of the pictures, I have to sort of jump back and forth. Let me, let me see. Just a moment, what is the next picture? Okay, the next picture then. Okay, it took till January of 1943 for our papers to be signed by Karl Mayer and for us to be uh, deemed half Jewish and for my mother to be deemed non Jewish. And this is the official paper. This is it. Eagle and the swastika and the whole rigmarole. There it is. Okay. Now I go back uh, to Rudy's story. Uh, Rudy uh, was, ex was the only child and very close to his mother. He has a picture of Ella Nussbaum in Italy because the Nussbaum family had first emigrated to Italy and only later on came to the Netherlands in 1938. Um, let me just now go fast forward, because it's such an interesting part of, of my book, I think. Rudy was in hiding, as I said, as of July of 1941. By uh, the fall of 1942, 42. He was getting stir crazy, and he was uh, hiding with a Dutch family, and the father in the family was in touch of the underground. And Rudy prevailed upon Mr. Blockland to get him in touch with the underground and see whether there wouldn't be any way for him to illegally leave the country. He wanted to get out, he wanted to be active, he wanted to join the Allied forces and help liberate the Netherlands. And lo and behold, Mr. Blockland found the right connection and um, there was a group who was actually at that, at that point printing false papers to be used by Allied pilots who had been shot down and who were not very safe in the Netherlands and they were hopefully being able to be uh, shipped back to Spain and from Spain to Portugal and from Portugal back to England and from there to wherever, whatever unit they belong to. Uh, Rudy did not know that he was a guinea pig to try out this route. All he knew was that there were these papers available, that he would have to play the role of being a German agent, trying to procure um, important parts for the German submarines, and that he had a permit to ride the German Wehrmacht train. The, uh, actually, the, 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 uh, the trains that were reserved for the armed war, uh, forces, and that's what he did. In uh, late September of 1942, he boarded a train Went to the, uh, it went out, uh, along the eastern border of the Netherlands down to Belgium and then via Paris 
to the Spanish border, where supposedly he was going to find members of the French underground who would help him across the Pyrenees. When he came to Tarp, excuse me for a second, it turned out that um, the Marquis, the French underground, had had a betrayal or whatever, there was nobody who would take him across the border. And it was absolutely unsafe for him to go by himself. He had a bit of school French like we all had, but it was nothing like the patois, the, the kind of French that was spoken in that particular region of France. France. If, he, if anybody had uh, stopped him and asked anything, uh, he would have been lost because his French was just not the right French. It was impossible. So he decided reluctantly to go back to the Netherlands, where at least he could go into hiding. His French was good enough to find a family that had a typewriter that he could use to type out uh, traveling papers, because he couldn't just travel. I mean, this was wartime, and it was very restricted. So he found a French uh, a family there, typed out his papers, and boarded the train, and went back to the Netherlands. He made a very, very big mistake. He thought being on the road, on, uh, traveling is dangerous. I should take the shortest route back to Amsterdam and went via Brussels instead of the roundabout along the eastern border. And when he tried to cross the border between Belgium and the Netherlands on the west side, he was stopped and told he was lacking an important piece of paper that would allow him to cross the border at that particular border post. And Rudy played, he never had any interest in theater, but he played his role so well. He said, what do you mean? I have an important thing to do. I have to go to Hamburg to uh, for, uh, uh, place orders for the submarines, the blah, blah, blah. Nothing doing, he had to leave the, car, the train. And so there he was uh, in a border, uh, in Rosenthal at the border, and uh, asked uh, the officer in charge, well, what do you want me to do? I can't possibly go back to Paris where his official office was. Uh, I don't have the time. I'm expected in Hamburg. And then the man said, tu, 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 why don't you just go to Brussels, to the high command of the Wehrmacht, and they will issue the right paper. So Rudy took the train back to Brussels, went to the high command of the Wehrmacht, presented his falsified papers, said, I have to be in Hamburg Tomorrow, I need to get the right paper. And the, and the fellow at the window said, oh, it'll take an hour. Your papers have to be verified, and uh, it has to be you know, done in good order. So Rudy walked through this park in Brussels, and uh, I think I have time to read this, because it's such a lovely story, I think, if, if I can find it fast enough. Yeah. It's in his words, not in my words. Here we are. I won't read the whole thing. Okay. It is, it is impossible to describe how I felt while waiting for, uh, for my papers to be issued. I knew full well who I really was. On the one hand. On the other hand, I had to slip into a totally different role. It was a matter of life or death. I was, of course, deeply conflicted about how to proceed, but decided eventually to go to the high command of the German army in Brussels to apply for the missing special permit, permit and needed to cross the border back to the Netherlands. The officer in charge told me to come back in an hour because my request and my papers had to be checked. That was the most dramatic hour of my entire life. While walking through this beautiful park in Brussels, there were these two inner voices. One said, you're crazy. This is bound to go wrong. And the other voice replied, what better choice do you have to offer? 
when I arrived back at the government building, the situation got even more dramatic. What did I see in front of the building? One of the infamous green vans of the German riot squads. I thought it was waiting there for me. I went in and asked the officer, do you have my papers? Do you have my permit? The man behind the desk got up and said, just a moment. He disappeared into another room. Was he going to get the green police? Agonizing minutes passed, during which I had to keep a straight face. Finally, he returned with a friendly smile and said, everything is all right. Here are your documents. Hi, Hitler. And I had an authentic special permit, permit to cross the border issued by the Wehrmacht. So he came back to Amsterdam with this authentic paper, which then gave him quite some status with the underground because they didn't have that paper. Now they had an, an extra paper that they could falsify and copy. Um, so I just want to give you my reaction when Moody came back. Uh, I was immensely grateful that he returned unharmed and noticeably steeled by what he termed his passage through hell. On the other hand, I had been looking forward to being just a 16-year-old schoolgirl for a while. Standing on tiptoe to keep up with my 21-year-old boyfriend had been exhilarating, but also very demanding. I needed time to mature and did not feel ready yet to enter a lasting commitment. But thinking of our friends and relatives and former neighbors in the camps, I realized how lucky I was and we continued to make the best of our difficult situation. And that's really the gist of my story, make the best of, of the given situation because it's sometimes out of your hands, you know. Um, I do not want to uh, speak too long because people should be able to ask questions. Uh, so, uh, at the, at the, the war started to end with the invasion of June 1944. The, uh, American and British and Canadian troops invaded uh, in Normandy and made a tremendously quick progress through the north. Paris was liberated, northern France was, Belgium was, the southeast corner of the Netherlands was. Then uh, they wanted to push on uh, early September of 1944 to liberate the Netherlands, but uh, the British troops were beaten back by, uh, near Arnhem and never made it across the River Rhine. So as winter descended upon us, we were not liberated. The southern part of the country was liberated. Now, if I say the southern part, you have to realize that the whole of the Netherlands has an area of one-seventh of the state of Oregon. It's a minuscule country. Still, it was a matter of life and death. Below the river line, people were liberated, actually led a normal life again. We were in Amsterdam and in all the other big cities like The Hague and Rotterdam. We did not have electricity. We did not have gas. We did not have food. And the hunger winter was really very, very dramatic with thousands of people starving to death. Uh, I was always the tomboy in the family, the sturdiest one. So I went on hunger tracks and tried to exchange clothing and table uh, linen, what have you, for food. And I was to a certain extent successful twice to bring some food home. But it was like a drop on a hot plate. It was, it was never enough. The hunger winter was really traumatic. People died like flies. It was just terrible. Well, that at the very end, 10 days before liberation, the Allies, the British in this case, started dropping food packages for us, which was wonderful, but it came too late for many people, and it, it came very close to liberation. Um, let me see. Maybe I should... Uh, I have much more about Karl Mayer, but I just want to, 
to read you something about uh, liberation. If I can find it first enough. Yeah, Okay. Um, the first weeks after the delirium of liberation were very difficult. Friends and acquaintances who had survived in hiding surfaced pale, famished, and impoverished. Often a family was missing, a family member was missing, a child here, a wife there, who had been found, arrested, and deported by the Nazis. Those who emerged from hiding had only the worn clothing on their backs. Most of them were utterly dependent on support from others, often from relatives abroad. In early June of 1945, the first concentration camp survivors arrived by train in Amsterdam. Among them was Rudy's cousin, returning from Terracine, Ilse, a young woman of 21 and the only survivor of her family, was so traumatized that we soon learned not to ask her any questions about the camp and her parents. Otto Frank also returned. Soviet troops had liberated him from Auschwitz and nursed him back to health. Mrs. Frank had died, we already know about that. The Russians were extremely good in nursing back people to life. The British who liberated Birkenbelsen had no idea and gave the famished people clear rations, which they could not digest, so people died even more. It was just unconscionable, really. Um, so, uh, let me, uh, day after day, Rudy and Otto Frank went to the Amsterdam Central Station to meet straggling survivors coming from the East. The two men held up photos of their missing loved ones, Otto Frank of Anne and Margot, Rudy of his mother. He already knew that his father was killed in Auschwitz, was murdered in Auschwitz. Uh, finally, a woman returning from Bergen-Belsen told them that Margot and Frank had died of typhus at a camp in March or early April of 1945 shortly before liberation. Otto Frank was heartbroken, of course. He was the sole survivor of the eight people who had hidden in the attic above his business. Around the same time, Rudy learned that his mother had succumbed several weeks after Bergen-Belsen was liberated by the British troops, who were much less adept at nursing starving inmates back to life than their Russian counterparts. So his mother also was not coming back, although she had been on a list of liberated people, which was, you know, him so unexpected for Rudy. He found himself to be the only, only survivor, just like Otto Frank was the only survivor. So let me now quickly go back to Karl Mayer, uh, because the book is really meant to be a book about Karl Mayer rather than about uh, myself. By, by the way, maybe I should say this right now. I never intended to write an uh, autobiography. I really only wanted to write a book about Karl Mayer. But I had a hard time finding a publisher. And then my dear friend Ursula Le Guin, anybody knows Ursula Le Guin, the writer? No? Ursula Le Guin. Yeah. She's a famous Oregon writer. You all should know her, really. Anyway, she said, Write your own story. She had read some of the uh, things that I had written down for our family, you know, for family uh, uh, information. She said, it's so fascinating. Intersperse your story with Karl Mayer's story, and you will see that you find a publisher. And she was right. I found a publisher. So thanks to Ursula Le Guin, really. Um, Karl Mayer. He was actually imprisoned by the Dutch after the war, although he had half Jews and had been an anti-Nazi, but still the Dutch were pretty radical. He was part of the German occupation, so he is a rascal, so he has to be imprisoned. So he spent actually almost a, a, a 15 months in, in a Dutch jail, 
It was, of course, not a concentration camp. He was fairly decently fed. He could get in touch with his family via Dutch friends, not directly. So it, it, it was miserable, but by no means comparable to being in a, in a German prison. And then he went back to Osnabrück and started his own law office. He had actually hoped to be somehow of service to the British occupation in that part of Germany, because he felt uh, rather strongly that he had proven himself to be a Democrat and not a uh, part of the uh, Nazi authoritar authoritarianism. But uh, it did not work out. For a short while in Hanover, which is the capital of Niedersachsen, he was uh, employed by the uh, Office of Cultural Affairs, which he greatly enjoyed. But his wife did not want to come along to, Osnabrück, uh, to Hanover, so he went back to Osnabrück and minded his law office. He was very much beloved by his personnel because he was such a humane person. Uh, he, the longer, the more years passed, the more he felt that he hadn't done enough, that he should have done more, although he didn't quite know how. He, he felt more and more guilty. And when Jacques Presser wrote his impressive book, Ashes in the Wind, about the, the uh, what is the subtitle? Ashes in the Wind. The, Destruction of Dutch Jewry, excellent book, by the way. Um, Kalmeyer acquired a Dutch copy. He read Dutch. He spoke some Dutch, but he read Dutch quite well. Read it and was moved in one way by the chapter that was devoted to what he had done, but also felt that it really was not enough. He, started, he wrote a letter to Presser and uh, said, too little, too little. So he really felt burdened by not having been able to do more. And that sort of feeling of not having been able to save more people accompanied him through life. And um, he died rather young. He died at the age of 69 in Osnabrück. And I just am going to read you the, uh, what his friend and colleague, a friend that had been uh, on his side from uh, not even kindergarten, but from uh, baby age, because it was an next door neighbor. And his nanny and Kalmeyer's nanny would push their frames next to each other, and the two little toddlers would play together. So this is the, uh, what his former uh, colleague and Come on, okay. yeah, here we are. So uh, this is what uh, Eberhard wrote about him. Our friend Hans Karlmeier's intelligent mind and warm heart, always quietly wide open for his fellow beings, whether close by or far away, were early on filled with the decisive strength of a wise person, ready to extend himself in any circumstance. In the unchanged personality of Hans after World War II, his acquaintances, including, including those who felt real friendship for him, recognized the familiar eccentric. He still seemed to go his own special ways, or not to go them. In any case, went about life somehow differently from how they themselves did. Unnoticeable to everyone except his wife, the black events of the past accompanied him as if they had become his own shadow. In the end, nothing mattered to him anymore but that which could bring a glimmer of light into the gloom. I think that's a very nice uh, way of saying goodbye to good friends. Uh, I want to close with the last pages of my book and then I'm open for questions. Uh... Okay. Karlmeier was a rare and genuine person, a German who during Hitler's rule clung to the ideals of human rights, justice, and tolerance. He despised Nazi doctrine and was indeed a righteous man among the nations 
who deserves to be remembered and honored. And he's honored at Yad Vashem in Israel. Not only by me and the families whose survival, whose survival he made possible, but by everyone. Dr. Martin Luther King, a strong opponent of the Vietnam War, said in his critical Riverside Church address on April 4, 1967, even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in a time of war, which is exactly, you will find in the book, uh, the words that Karl Mayer used when he was defending himself in the Netherlands, when he was in prison in the Netherlands. Karl Mayer had, yet Karl Mayer had bravely managed to chisel away at his government's murderous measures and in doing so had saved thousands of lives. Sadly, in post-war Germany, post-World War II Germany, his enlightened ideas were up against the entrenched, powerful forces that Dr. King warned against. And he, uh, I think I didn't read the warning, okay. Um, oh yes, it's coming. He said, King said, when machines and computers, profit motives, and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are incapable of being conquered. We are now living in an epoch, that's me now, end of quote. We are now living in an epoch in which the nefarious triplets clearly have the upper hand. After decades of struggling for a better world, it's hard not to slip into despondency. Hans Kalmeier's low-key sabotage offers a model of resistance for people who will not surrender their integrity. For that, I am grateful to him too. And I would like to end with that and leave you time for questions. Okay, that's it. <laughs> We, we are going to uh, take all of our questions from the microphone uh, tonight uh, so that our viewers online can hear as well. Um, I'm going to start you off with a question, if I might. Uh, so much of your story, the hero is not a knight in shining armor, but it's about documentation yeah. <laughs> and how Hans was able to first get you on a list that said that your grandparents' status was in question. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually you got approved as being at least half Aryan. Yeah. Can you share with us that climactic moment of what it was like when you got that documentation? And how did that immediately change your story to make it so much different than the Anne Frank story? Oh, well, of course we were elated. We always, maybe foolishly, had the confidence that our story was good enough that eventually we would be recognized as not fully Jewish. Uh, whether it was an illusion or not, I cannot tell, but we always had this feeling. So when finally in January of 1943, the news came, we joyfully shredded our stars. That's where the title comes from. We got rid of our stars. Um, it was, of course, important because our own lives were no longer endangered. My father was relatively secure because he was part of a mixed marriage, and Karl Mayer made sure that in the Netherlands, uh, children of mixed marriages were not counted as Jewish. There were different laws in Germany, but he clung to the Dutch law, which says children cannot make choices. So uh, he, he chose for mixed marriage kids to be not Jewish, period. So that's helped a lot, obviously. Uh, for me, the most important was, thing was that I, again, could look after Rudy, who was in hiding. I could uh, bicycle over to him. I could bring him books, flowers, uh, anything to make his life more bearable. So that was the most important thing for me. Um, 
for my mother, it eased life tremendously because she could uh, shop all day long like everybody else, not just in a few hours set aside for Jews. So she, uh, running the household was much easier for her. And my father was also uh, relatively safe. However, uh, at one point, Jewish husbands of non-Jewish wives were told to do day labor for the German occupation. And so my father was called to do day labor. But lo and behold, he could produce a big chest X-ray with a huge TB scar on it. Because my father had gotten tuberculosis during World War I and was actually sent to Switzerland. You know, the story of the magic mountain. He was up in a sanatorium during World War I. So yay for tuberculosis. It <laughs> saved my father's life. Uh, uh, one of the ironies. Okay, so that answers your question. Other questions? Yeah. You were saying your father was Jewish, correct? Say it again. You said your father was Jewish, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so did you guys, like, practice any of, like, what were kind of like maybe Jewish traditions or well, activities in your family? I, when I grew up, we considered ourselves Jewish. Uh, uh, we went to the liberal synagogue in, in Frankfurt, which is a beautiful building. When we came to the Netherlands, Mr. Frank and my father and a few other people saw to it that a liberal Jewish community would be founded in Amsterdam. There was no such thing. The Dutch were either... Uh, observing Jews or they didn't follow any religious practices. This in-between of liberal Judaism was just not known in the Netherlands, so it was the refugees who started it. Yes, and we did go to the, to the temple and we did have a religious education. I could read the prayers like anybody else. The way we learned Hebrew was, I think, an abomination because we didn't learn it as a language, but we learned it like Catholics learn Latin, you know, without knowing the structure, without uh, seeing it as a live language. It was just to be able to follow the prayers, which we could. But of course, we didn't tell anybody when it mattered to our lives. And I must say, by the way, that I love to go to Catholic mass with my grandmother. I thought the, the incense was just very <laughs> fragrant and... Uh, I like the theater that's part of mass, so, uh, so I, I feel comfortable just about in any church and, and can see the importance of a religion, which really means religion means being connected. That's what the word means. And so uh, religion is important, but I don't care what persuasion. That doesn't matter to me. Does that doesn't answer your question? Yep. Thank you very much. Okay. Other questions? So between the time of you re being able to remove your star and being somewhat free, yeah. and the time you're waiting for liberation to happen, yeah. eventually you make your way to Portland, Oregon. See that again? Eventually you arrived in Portland, Oregon. There's a lot of time between taking off your star and arriving in Portland. Yeah. Is that in your book? Okay, yes, my book. My book is, uh, goes all the way through till now, really. I, I did not stop at, at the end of the war. No. It, it even tells you what my dissertation interest was and, and so on, yes. The book is totally up to 2019 oh. when, when it was published. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, what brought us to Oregon, well, um, my husband, after he got his PhD in physics, he was a nuclear physicist. Uh, we traveled quite a bit for him as a postdoc to get experience. And then eventually spent a year in Bloomington, Indiana, liked it quite well there, went back to Europe, lived in Switzerland for a year, but uh, we knew this was temporary, and then decided to settle in the United States in 1957. And believe me, for a nuclear physicists in 1957 to want to come to the United States, yeah, come in, 
come in, come in. Those Russians with Sputnik, you know, we have to be. So, I mean, it was again one of the ironies of history because 20 years earlier, when his life and his parents' life would have depended on leaving Europe, the, the quota was filled, there was absolutely no way for him to get to the United States. And the same person, all of a sudden, was very welcome, which shows you the arbitrariness of all of these things, really. The arbitrariness that we also feel now is making the refugees from Ukraine welcome and the refugees from Guatemala and San Salvador not, not welcome. I mean, it's, it's awful. <laughs> okay. Rob, I have a question from uh, one of our online viewers. Do you know of anyone who could have applied to be not fully Jewish and not take advantage of it because they didn't want to present themselves as not Jewish at all? I, I didn't quite get this. Could you, I'm sorry, repeat, please. Do you know of anyone? Do you know of anyone who could have applied to be not fully Jewish? not take advantage of it because they didn't want to present themselves of not Jewish at all? Oh, no, no. Anybody who could. Uh, it's also a matter of life and death, I mean. Oh. <laughs> no, I, I, I do, would not know of anybody who would have had a possibility to uh, be declared non-Jewish and not avail themselves of that possibility, I mean. But what kind, whom do you do any favor by uh, being a victim if you can, uh, if you can escape it? I, I, I don't know. There might be the odd person, but I don't know. Good evening. So obviously throughout the years, you had a lot of time to collect your thoughts and, and write out this book. So I'm curious. What made you decide to write it now compared to all of the years that you, you would have had time to before? Okay, okay, thank you. Well, you know, I, I would like to say this is a good question, except that the term a good question always means that you don't know the answer. But it is a good question and I do know the answer, okay? <laughs> so uh, what happened is that uh, my husband, who got very involved in anti-nuclear matters as a nuclear physicist and actually would be horrified, I want to bring this in, that uh, people, particularly in Corvallis, are so much in favor of the small mo modular nuclear reactors. I think he, would, he will turn in his grave because he knows how dangerous it is. Anyway, um, he was at a conference in Münster, Germany, and uh, was put up with a family who, uh, in, in Osnabrück, next, uh, the town ne next door, so to speak, and uh, they said uh, there is a high school teacher here, Mr. Niebaum, who is writing the story of a Hans Karlmeier. Does that name mean anything to you? because Kalmeyer was from Osnabrück, and Rudy thought, yes, he had heard the name, but he was going to ask me. And of course for me, uh, I knew we were on the Kalmeyer list, so it was very important for me to contact that high school teacher in Osnabrück and find out what he was doing. And he was actually writing a biography of Hans Kalmeyer. That was in the 90s. And I decided then and there that uh, once this biography biography is written, I was going to translate it into English. And so I did when it was written, and as I progressed, I more and more felt, uh-uh, that's not a book that's going to fly in, in, in this country or in any other Anglo-Saxon country, because the author, the high school teacher, was far left, God forbid, and so uh, he had a lot of German post World War II politics, uh, very critical. And I knew this book would never be published in this country. And so I was a little desperate, and I asked Ursula, who is a very published writer, what do you think I should do? And she said, put in your own story too. And that's how it happened. So she suggested that uh, really about eight or nine years ago, 
And then uh, I set to work, uh, worked uh, on rewriting uh, Newbaum's words and adding my words. And that's how the book came to me. Okay. Do we have any other questions tonight? Yes, young man, come on up. Um, out of all the countries in Europe, what, what, why did you choose to go to the Netherlands in particular? I, I'm sorry, I, my ears are not very good. Could somebody please re, 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 reward it? He would like to know why, of all the countries in Europe, did you go to the Netherlands? Okay. Uh, that's that's got a, also a good question which I can answer. Um, because there was a there, were, there was a world war in from 1914 to 1918, and during that war the Netherlands were neutral. There was no war, just like in Switzerland, and it seemed a good place to go. Where even if Hitler was going to make war, it would not, we hoped, come to the Netherlands. So it seemed to be a safe place. Good question. Any, any other question? We have one more from the other mic, okay. it seems like. Hi, Lorraine. <laughs> um, I have one question because I've never asked my mom that question. For all of those like you who had false papers and you still live in the Jewish neighborhood, how did other Jews take that? Or did they know? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with my, my, my leg is getting lame, and my ears are getting deafer, deafer as the time goes on. That's okay. Say, say it again, please. There were all of you in the Jewish neighborhood yes, in that got false papers, right? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did other Jews who did not have false papers react to that? Or did they know? Well. There were not many left by, by 1943. Oh, the Jewish council was still alive, and some privileged people. But uh, by Christmas of 1942, mm -hmm. already 40,000 Jews had been deported. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, people who knew said more power to you. <laughs> they, they were not, I don't think anybody expressed any envy or anger, but just, they just felt more power to you. And we actually, because we were so closely uh, part of the Jewish, uh, the Jews of Amsterdam side, of the southern part of Amsterdam, my mother spent just about, well, my mother made packages for Westerbau for the transition camp by the dozens. My sister and I stayed home from school to bring packages to the post office to send to the camps. We, should, we thought we could be useful and help people. It wouldn't have helped anybody for us to be also uh, deported, you know. The way I could definitely help Rudy, and we could help other people. Uh, we hid things for other people, and we sent packages. I, don't, I do not think people always ask me, do you feel guilty? I really don't feel guilty because nobody, nobody had to go in my place. It was different in Camp Westerbork, which was the transit camp, where every week 1,000 people had to be shipped, deported to the camps in the east. And if I had been on the list and I could find some reason why I should be deferred, uh, because I had something important to do in the camp, somebody else would have to go in my place. And that would, that would, I think, weigh on your conscience. But this was not really our situation, because we were simply not counted as Jews anymore. And so that's, uh, I never felt terribly guilty. I felt a great uh, agony for my schoolmates and uh, friends, but not really guilty. No, I'm glad. I was just worried, because there were so many collaborators in Holland that maybe that would have been an issue if somebody knew in your neighborhood, oh, yeah. they were Jewish, but, you know, I'm Jewish, but I didn't get the paper, so yeah. they could turn you in. No, uh, well, partly also because my grandmother, of course, had always been around without a star, so, I mean, our mixed background had uh, bona fides, you know, we, we, so, no, that, that was never a problem. Great. Yeah. Can you tell them, because I know about that, how a package was supposed to be sent to Westerbork? 
given by mail. Yeah, right, but I mean, you had to send something and a ticket, and then it had to go. You had to have a ticket, and the same ticket had to go back to Westerbork. I don't remember oh, you, that. I just went to the post office. You were too office. young. Too young. We went to the post office and, and mail that. That's all I know. And uh, they could write a postcard uh, every two weeks or so to, to thank us. So we knew the packages arrived. And they could express their wishes sometimes, and they did. And it was not just Rudy's parents who spent a long time in Westerbork, mm -hmm. actually from uh, November 42 till... January or February 44, because uh, the father was a pharmacist, and Westerbork had an infirmary. I mean, one of those crazy things. People went to the infirmary and were nursed back to life and then were sent to, were sent to Auschwitz. Totally crazy. But because of the deferment that my father-in-law had, they lasted in Westerbork relatively long, which was to their advantage, of course. Anything else I could answer? From the back. Maureen, we have a viewer who would like to know why you changed your first name. Say that again. I'm sorry. Why did you change your first name? We have a viewer who wanted to know that. Could somebody please? The title of your book or the subtitle of your book has your birth name, but yep. you now go by Laureen. Oh, why, why am I Laureen and not Hannelore? Uh, well, because Hannelore is a very German name, which I got rid of right away when we moved to the Netherlands. We did not want to be uh, super German in the Netherlands. In fact, I, I was called Hansi in German, Hansi, which I didn't like. But in Dutch, I was called Hansi, which I did like, which means really little Hans. But try to get Americans to pronounce Hansi. You can't do it. So I, I thought, well, I might as well latch on to the tail end of my name, Lore, and make it Lorraine, partly also because my father was from Lorraine in now France. So it has, you know, it, it has elements of my name and elements of my father's background. It's a homemade name. I made it up myself and I found it. I, <laughs> I found that other people have, have that name too. We are going to um, end on your name. Um, I do have a couple of announcements, but first, can we give a wonderful thank you for learning? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, if you can be seated again, Lorraine, can we get you to move to the book yes, table? Yes, the sooner um, the better, because my, my leg is getting lame, but I, I need to collect my papers. So that and while she is doing that, I do have a couple of announcements for our group um, and for our viewers online. We do have one more event still coming uh, for our Holocaust Memorial Week, and it is tomorrow night at 7 p.m., um, it is a public talk by Lawrence Barron. It's teaching the Holocaust through film to children, tweens, and teenagers. Um, it is live via Zoom. It's on the same link that you probably found your tickets for to get here as well. So do consider joining us for that. And um, someone had asked about the book and why it was now. Um, you have a book that will now fly in this country, Lorene. Um, if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to do that. I encourage you actually to swing by and pick one up at the back and get it autographed if you would like. Um, it is a beautiful weaving of four different stories. Um, in the background, you have Anne Frank. Um, in the foreground, uh, you have Hans Carmyle, Carl, Carl Meyer. Um, and then you have this beautiful uh, love story between Lorraine and uh, Rito. Um, so I encourage you uh, to do that, if not tonight, at some other time. And that closes our time. Thank you very much for joining us, and safe and journeys. <laughs>